Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. We know that a few other people will be coming in, but we wanted to, we have a pretty packed agenda and wanted to leave opportunity for questions. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is David Adenaro. I'm going to be the moderator for this uh, presentation. I am the Deputy Commissioner for Public Health Services uh, in the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, I want to welcome, thank everybody for joining this webinar and uh, particularly to uh, our uh, panelists uh, that you'll be hearing from and, and have some opportunity to hear the answers some questions. We're going to be covering a number of topics today about monkeypox, uh, what it is, the symptoms, who's at risk, potential treatments and the vaccines that may be available. This webinar is being recorded, and we will make this recording available on the, the department's YouTube page. So if you're not able to stay for the entire time or want to go back and get more information or share this uh, with anybody, uh, you will be able to. Uh, and if you have any questions, you're uh, more than welcome to put them into uh, the Q&A function. Uh, I just want to take a brief moment to introduce our panel. Uh, you can see Dr. Edward Lifshitz. Uh, Dr. Lifshitz is a medical director of our department's communicable disease service. We also have uh, Dr. Darby McDermott. Uh, she uh, has a double role, both as the New Jersey State Public, New Jersey Public Health Veterinarian, and also one of the leads in the uh, infectious and zoonotic disease program uh, dealing with the monkeypox outbreak. Mr. Christopher Menchner, who is our assistant commissioner for our division of HIV, STD, and TB services and Kathy Ahern O'Brien, who is the Executive Director of the Highest AIDS Foundation. I'm gonna ask Dr. Lifshitz to start us out uh, discussing um, basically some background on monkeypox, what is unusual about this current outbreak, uh, and sharing uh, some information about the status of the outbreak, outbreak in New Jersey. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lifshitz. Thank you, Dr. Adenauer. And Thank you all for joining us today as we talk about monkeypox and what's going on in New Jersey right now. Monkeypox is a disease that's caused by the monkeypox virus. Uh, it's named the monkeypox virus, the monkeypox disease, because initially it was first found in monkeys in Africa back in the 1950s with the first reported human case back in 1970. Uh, prior to 2022, meaning prior to this current outbreak that we have currently in right now, monkeypox had mostly been reported in people in several Central and West African countries. Um, most of those cases in, in those countries were actually uh, related to people coming into contact with infected animals. This is what's known as a zoonotic virus, meaning it can jump from animals to people. Uh, but it also could spread from person to person and has been seen to spread from person to person in the past as well. Um, now, again, prior to 2022, it was very rare to see monkeypox outside of those endemic areas in Africa. And what's really made this different is the fact that it has shown up in the United States as well as other countries, such as uh, many countries in Europe, and is more prolonged. Currently in the United States, you know, these are the numbers. This is what we're currently seeing uh, that just over 7,000 total cases overall in uh, mm -hmm. the United States, over 26,000 cases globally. And in New Jersey, um, as of yesterday, we have seen a total of 214 cases. As you can see from our map here, uh, the disease mm -hmm. is predominantly, but not entirely focused in the northeastern part of the state, mm -hmm. but it can be found anywhere within the state as well. Mm -hmm. So what happens when people get monkeypox? Well, you get exposed to the virus. In a moment, we'll talk about what exposure means. And then after incubation period, it can last anywhere from up to 21 days, uh, but most typically between about five to 13 days, you begin to develop some symptoms. Um, most typically those symptoms included fever, a severe headache, swollen glands or lymph nodes, chills, exhaustion, aches, backache, you know, a whole bunch of things that can't be easily distinguished from other infectious diseases such as flu or even COVID these days as well. Uh, commonly though, within a couple of days of developing those symptoms, a rash develops. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing here as well is that not 
always do these things happen in exactly this order. I mean, sometimes the rash is the first thing that is seen. So these are some pictures of, of what that rash can look like. Uh, basically, it can be difficult to distinguish from many other rashes. Uh, they can look like pimples or blisters. They can appear on the face, sometimes inside the mouth, on the hands, the feet, the chest, the genitals, or around the, the rectum and anus. Uh, the rash can be in just one area of the body or it can spread throughout the body. It does go through different stages. You see some of those different stages here in these pictures here uh, before healing completely. And it takes about two to four weeks to go through that entire process. All right, thank you, Ed. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Dr. McDermott, who's going to talk about uh, a little bit more about who's at risk uh, what you should do if you think you've been exposed um, or um, may have monkeypox, and talk about testing. Thanks, Dr. Adenaro, and good afternoon, everyone. So as Dr. Lifshitz did mention, primarily in um, this outbreak, we are seeing monkeypox being spread from person to person. And monkeypox can spread from the time symptoms start until that rash has fully healed and a fresh layer of skin has formed. So a person is considered infectious from the time their symptoms start. Um, they are not considered infectious before their symptoms have started. In terms of person-to-person -person spread, monkeypox is spread through direct contact with the infectious rash, scabs, or infected person's body fluids. It can also be spread through mucus or saliva um, during prolonged face-to-face -face contact or intimate physical contact, such as kissing, cuddling, or sex. So this does have to be that prolonged co uh, contact and uh, short periods of face-to-face -face contact is not considered um, a, a high risk of exposure. Additionally, it could be spread through touching items that were previously um, touched by an infectious rash or the body fluids. So some examples of that would be um, the person's clothing, if they had um, been in contact with that rash or uh, infected um, sheets or bed linens. Additionally, this is a zoonotic disease. So in the past, um, it, can be, it has been spread from infected animals, but we are not seeing that currently during this outbreak. If someone is um, pregnant uh, while infected with monkeypox, it could also be spread during pregnancy or birth. So overall, in the United States, the risk to the public remains low, but anyone who has contact with a person with monkeypox can get the virus. As I said, people with monkeypox are only considered to be able to spread the virus when they have symptoms. In the current outbreak, many but not all cases are have been in people who identify as gay, bisexual, or men who have sex with men. But as I mentioned, anyone can get the virus. This is not um, a tra uh, sexually transmitted disease in, in the uh, common sense. However, intimate contact or direct contact can spread the virus. Um, and Additionally, people with multiple or anonymous sexual partners in the past 14 days may be at a higher risk for having been exposed to the virus. So in order to prevent mo monkeypox, um, people should avoid close skin-to-skin -skin contact with anyone who has a rash that looks like monkeypox. Additionally, limiting the number of sexual partners may help reduce the risk of getting monkeypox. Um, so you should not touch anyone's rash or scabs. Um, if someone has monkeypox, they should not be kissing, hugging, cuddling, or having sex while they still have that rash present. Um, additionally, sharing uh, eating utensils or cups should not be done if someone has monkeypox, and um, you should not handle or touch the bedding, towels, or clothing of an infected person. With many diseases, it's always recommended to wash your hands often or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. And so that is also the case with monkeypox. Um, again, avoid touching any rash you see on others and uh, consider minimizing skin-to-skin -skin contact with someone who has uh, a, a rash and it may be monkeypox. If you are sick, um, stay home and contact a healthcare provider. And uh, particularly if you have a rash, discuss the possibility of, of monkeypox if there's a, a potential there. 
And additionally, if you think you've been exposed to monkeypox, um, you should contact your health department. So your local health department can assist um, with uh, coordinating vaccination um, if there's been a high risk exposure. And we'll go a little bit more into detail about those vaccinations. Um, additionally, as Dr. Lifeshitz mentioned, there is um, a potential for monkeypox symptoms to start within 21 days after that exposure. Um, so the local health department uh, will work to, to monitor um, an individual with, uh, for any symptoms and help them um, to identify and discuss if any additional care or testing is needed if symptoms do develop. All right, thank you very much, Darby. I'm gonna take over uh, the next uh, couple of slides uh, and then uh, introduce some of our other panelists uh, with a couple of questions. So. We do have a vaccine uh, that has been uh, licensed to prevent monkeypox in adults. It's, uh, it's uh, name is Genius. Uh, it does current. It's approved for uh, those over the age of eighteen, and there's some additional FDA approvals required for the use in children. Though it is um, uh, it is can be used in children. It is a two injection uh, uh, vaccine, so it's uh, one dose, and then four weeks later, uh, the individual would get a second dose. And it can take up to two weeks after the second dose uh, to be considered fully vaccinated in terms of the benefit of the vaccine. Currently, uh, besides uh, individuals who may receive it to prevent uh, pre-exposure monkeypox, uh, those uh, we target those uh, within four days of an exposure uh, to receive the vaccine. Uh, which may help prevent somebody who's been exposed uh, from developing symptoms. Uh, and we also know that there's a window up to 14 days. So from four to 14 days, we're receiving the vaccine. If you've been exposed or potentially exposed to monkeypox, may not prevent the disease, but can limit uh, the symptoms that somebody may develop. And Currently, um, and it's a little bit to explain, we are focused on post-exposure prophylaxis. So there are two groups that essentially we are focused on. The first group are those who are a known close contact within the last 14 days of someone who tested positive for orthopox or monkeypox virus, or with someone who's highly suspicious of having monkeypox while the test is pending. And again, that second part is important uh, in terms of getting as much information as possible because we, we recognize that the most benefit uh, is for somebody to be vaccinated as, as soon after a known exposure as possible. This process is being handled by uh, our local health departments in coordination with the Department of Health arranging that uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. The other one, which is called PEP++ or expanded PEP, uh, is recognizing that there are currently people uh, who have may have been exposed to monkeypox, but um, do not know that they have been or that we cannot uh, get contact information. Uh, and currently uh, from the CDC guidance that focuses on people who've had multiple sexual partners in the past two weeks in an area with known monkeypox uh, uh, in existence. Um, and so for us, it's very important that we, we get this messaging out through um, uh, through efforts like this to explain to people uh, to, to understand their risks and that they may be eligible for the vaccine. And included in that are people who are aware that one of their sexual partners in the last two weeks may have been diagnosed with monkeypox, but they have not received, let's say, official notification of that. So again, in both these categories, it is around uh, individuals uh, who either have a known or a potential exposure uh, to the virus uh, and using the vaccine to help prevent either uh, transmission or severity of symptoms. And for a moment, I want to stop there uh, and uh, have a couple of other panelists come in. And the first one uh, is uh, Kathy. Uh, so Kathy, the, the Hyacinth AIDS Foundation, which is partnering with Project Living Out Loud in Jersey City, is one of our uh, the first five community vaccination partners for the uh, monkeypox virus for Genios. What are you seeing, seeing and hearing? And uh, what has that experience been like? And, and what has the demand been like for the vaccine? 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Dr. Adenara. So the demand has been overwhelming, quite frankly. You know, they, they, um, when the state rolled out the PEP Plus Plus program, there were three organizations. It was us, VNA, and uh, NJCRI in Newark. And every site was really overwhelmed with, with phone calls and texts and, and emails. And so, you know, I think that the when we expanded it to the Newbridge Medical Center and to, um, I'm forgetting who the fifth was, uh, uh, Cooper Hospital down in Camden, you know, I think that the demand eased a little bit, but, and when I say a little bit, I mean just a, a tiny little bit, but I think, that, you know, the, the gay community, gay men in particular, certainly recognize the need for the vaccine and they are um, literally doing whatever they can to, to get it. So, um, you know, my sense is that people are calling multiple organizations. They are, you know, they're really knocking on whatever door they can to, to get the vaccine. Thank you. And I, I think that, uh, you know, given the community that, that you work with and the community that has been most affected so far by monkeypox and the one that we're attempting to get as much of the education and certainly the vaccine to, you know, Kathy, I'd like to ask you and both Chris, you know, talking about, you know, that the impact, particularly uh, in, uh, in the, the gay community, and also, you know, what more we can be doing uh, to ensure that we're communicating effectively, and we're also communicating in a way that does not necessarily, you know, create any stigma around uh, the disease um, at this point in time. Sure. I, you know, I think that's a great question. I think when we first started talking about doing vaccinations and, and even when we first heard about MPOX internally at Hyacinth, uh, the response from, from some of my staff and certainly the broader community was not again, right? Because it feels like HIV again, it feels like sure. COVID again. And it feels very much like that community is being stigmatized again because it happens to be occurring in within that community. And, you know, we all know this in COVID. COVID it, viruses like community. They like It likes to spread where large groups of people get together and where it is easily transmissible. And that is the definition of MPOX, right? It is very easily transmissible through contact, through, through towels at the beach, through bedding. And so I think what we have to be careful about doing is making sure that we continue to, to make the point that it is, a, it is a virus that is transmissible within any community, but in this moment, it just happens to be within the gay male community and that we are doing everything we can to mitigate it and to try and, and control it um, so that it doesn't spread beyond. And you know we've seen that a little bit in other states where, where it's expanded p past the, the, the gay community. Um, but I think, again, I think that, that gay men right now are being cautious. I think they are, they are looking at what's happening out there. Um, I think that, you know, they recognize that, that, that getting a vaccine is probably the most important thing they can do at this point. But I'll also say that, you know, it, it, it probably is hitting at the absolute worst time in, in terms of it's the summertime and it's the summer of 2022. So we've just gone through 2020 when nobody went out and 2021 where people were going out a little bit, but they weren't, you know, they weren't quite out fully. And now here we are in 2022. Every, every single county state has had a pride event this summer. There's one coming up in Jersey City at the end of August. You know, it, 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 the environment is just so ripe for this for this, uh, for this virus. Do you want to add anything uh, to Kathy's comments? Yeah, I, first I just, I second everything that, that Kathy said. I, I think she hit the nail on the head on, on a few fronts there. Um, just wanted to note that, you know, at the Department of Health on monkeypox, COVID, a salmonella outbreak and everything in between, we follow the data. And as Kathy noted, this is not, you know, inherently, um, sexually transmitted disease. It is not unique to the gay and bisexual male community. It just happens to have started and, and exists there right now. Um, and the data certainly point to that both in New Jersey and nationally. So again, like all things at the Department of Health, we follow the data and we work with trusted partners, especially when we're talking about serving a community that unfortunately has experienced a lot of stigma and discrimination in traditional healthcare settings. 
And fortunately for us at DOH, we have a number of wonderful partners, including Hyacinth, NJCRI, and the VNA in Asbury Park that have served the LGBTQ community for decades. And there is an enormous amount of trust and respect and, and relationship there. Um, so we're grateful that we have these partnerships where folks who are at risk um, can go and get vaccinated, get treated in a setting that's comfortable to them and accessible to them. Um, so we're just really grateful for the partnerships. And you know, Kathy spoke to the, the um, intense demand at the beginning of the rollout. I think that's partially because there are, there's legitimate need for vaccination and, and treatment amongst the, the folks we're talking about. And also because there are real fears out there of, uh, of exposures and a lot of uncertainty right now. Uh, but it also speaks to how comfortable many folks from the gay and bisexual male community feel comfortable accessing services at three, these three sites, um, in addition to the other two sites as well. I just wanted to, to note the, the first three, given their long relationships serving the LGBTQ community. And I appreciate that, Chris. I think, uh, again, uh, Kathy, your program and the other programs we've turned to have been great uh, partners uh, throughout this. And uh, if uh, Darby, you want to go to the next slide, I'll cover this before turning it back over to you. Right now in the state of New Jersey, we have five locations that are currently uh, administering vaccine. Uh, Kathy's program in Jersey City, uh, the uh, VNA of Central Jersey in Asbury Park, uh, Northern North Jersey Community Research Initiative in Newark, uh, down in Camden County, the Cooper Vaccine and Testing Center, and uh, Bergen Newbridge Medical Center in coordination with uh, some of the local health departments in Paramus. This is the beginning of a, a very large effort. We will be expanding as we get more vaccine, and we are having some more vaccine coming into the state over the last few days. We will be expanding to additional locations, uh, both you know, into this weekend and next week. Uh, and this is the beginning of, uh, this is not going to be a, we vaccinate for a couple of months and we're done. We are going to be doing this with a large number of partners and with as many of the doses that the federal government is making available to us. Uh, I think the important thing is those, those partners that we're currently using are going to remain an important part of that effort, regardless of how much we expand. And Dr. McDermott, I want to, um, I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, to talk about um, uh some of the other uh, um, items, particularly around uh, isolation and testing uh, related to monkeypox. Sure. Um, so if you think you have monkeypox, the first thing you should do is contact your healthcare provider and let them know that you're um, thinking that you may have monkeypox. Um, when you go in to seek healthcare, wear a mask and cover the lesions as much as possible um, to pre prevent any um, potential um, spread. Um, you should get tested if it's recommended by your healthcare provider. And that testing involves collecting swabs of the rash. Um, so a rash does need to be present in order to be tested for monkeypox. And then while those test results are pending, isolate at home in order to prevent um, any kind of spread. If those test results do come back positive and you have monkeypox, um, there are certain home isolation recommendations that should be followed. Um, so since monkeypox can be spread while someone has um, lesions until those uh, lesions have, um, the scabs have fallen off, the person should isolate until those lesions have resolved, the scabs have fallen off, and a fresh layer of intact skin is formed. And that can be two to four weeks. Um, if possible, um, in the household, use a separate bathroom if there are others who live in the same household. And if that's not possible, um, just make sure to be cleaning and disinfecting after use to prevent any kind of exposure. Um, the house should be routinely cleaned and disinfected using um, an EPA registered disinfectants and, and pay specific attention to those commonly touched surfaces. Um, Persons with monkeypox should stay home, except as required for any emergencies or follow-up medical care. Wearing a well-fitting mask or respir respirator is recommended if you do need to be around other people in the home. And then, as always, wash hands with soap and water or use hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Additionally, persons with monkeypox should abstain from all sexual activity while they have any symptoms. Avoid close contact with other people and pets in the home. Avoid the use of contact lenses um, to prevent any accidental eye infection. 
In addition, avoid shaving areas of the body that have blisters or lesions uh, because that may spread the virus if shaving is occurring. All right, uh, thank you. And Dr. Lifshitz, uh, I think the last remaining slide we have is talking about um, uh, a potential treatment uh, antiviral for uh, those who develop uh, monkeypox. Yes, yeah, so, and the good news about this virus is that for the large majority of people, it will end up going away by itself. However, the less good news is that unfortunately some people, particularly those people who are immunocompromised or uh, otherwise frail or, or the very young um, may not do as well. And in addition, this can certainly be extremely uncomfortable uh, before it does pass. And as such, we are lucky that there is an antiviral medication, uh, one that was actually developed to protect against smallpox, um, but is being used against monkeypox as well. That can shorten the duration of the disease and improve symptoms more quickly. Um, as Darby uh, mentioned earlier, the single most important thing to do if people are concerned, if they think they might have monkeypox, or certainly if they think they have any severe symptoms of monkeypox or the concern, is go speak to their healthcare provider because uh, they're the one that will be able to guide you down the path of whether you have it and whether the medication is appropriate for you or not. All right, thank you. And, and uh, we're going to leave this slide up as we're talking. Um, these have uh, some of the uh, places you can get additional information, including uh, our website uh, at the Department of Health. Uh, I wanted to kind of get an opportunity to get a, ask a few more questions of this uh, great panel and then perhaps take some questions uh, that are coming in through the Q&A. I guess my first one to the panel is, uh, you know, what are the key messages right now for the general public and also for those that are currently in higher risk groups of uh, exposure to monkeypox. Uh, I don't know if uh, Darby, you wanna say a few words and then uh, see who else wants to chime in. Sure. Um, so I, I think uh, as Dr. Lifshitz just mentioned, a couple of the, the key things that you can do is first, um, you know, continue to stay informed. We'll continue to be updating our, our website about different cases that are occurring in New Jersey. But if you have any concerns that you may have a rash, you may have symptoms, talk to your healthcare provider and um, talk to your um, your social network, your friends, your family, and, and see if there are you know, uh, any concerns and, and any exposures. And um, uh, I'll, I'll pass it to others to, to add anything else that they'd like to So, um, you know, in, in the in the gay community, we learned this in the, in the early days of the HIV crisis, you don't ever want to tell somebody not to engage in sexual activity, right? It's human nature. It's pleasurable. Everybody wants to, you know, to take care of themselves. And I think the messaging should be is to um, know your risk, understand your risk, and take the steps that you think are necessary to protect your own sexual health. And if that means maybe limiting partners for a period of time, you know, whatever steps it is that, that you want to take. And, um, you know, one of the things I saw that the CDC put out reminded me to the very early days of, of HIV and, and the safer sex practices that we talked about then, you know, they, they apply in, the, in, the, in this case as well. All right, thanks. Uh, Chris, any other thoughts you have, um, particularly for the current at-risk community? Um, yeah, just um, kind of, you know, echoing what I, I noted before, that if you do have, you know, questions, fears, risks, we have, you know, great partners, not just the three that I, I noted before that have long served the LGBTQ community in New Jersey, but many others too. And, and certainly, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me or whomever your contact is at DOH for more information on other partners that might be more local to you that you can go to for, um, you know, appropriate information in a place that is, you know, kind of culturally experienced in serving folks who identify as LGBTQ. Um, and just wanted to echo, I'd be remiss if I didn't echo what Kathy said on the, you know, kind of taking precautions front, you know, I think, and especially in our division, the work that we do on sexual health, we're kind of very, like, realistic and, and practical that no matter at, at times kind of what's going on out there, folks are still going to engage in sex and taking the proper precautions are the name of the game and the proper precautions in, in this space right now in this situation have, have shifted and expanded a little bit. There's like the existing proper precautions to prevent HIV and STDs and now proper precautions to prevent the spread of monkeypox. So, you know, folks can still live their lives as they wish. There are just some, you know, kind of 
uh, precautions that need to be put in place to keep everyone safe. And we're just trying to really uh, push that message out there and, and not you know, push a message where we're you know, telling people not to engage in things that they find pleasurable that are part of their lives, but just do it in a way that's, that's safer for themselves and for the public. Yeah, I think reinforcing the fact that this is um, this is a uh, novel virus in the sense of, of uh, it has not been largely prevalent in the United States in this way or transmission between uh, persons. So I would encourage everybody, one, uh, I think uh, uh, we did a very good job of outlining some of the symptoms um, and having people sh should be monitoring themselves. And if they are experiencing any of the symptoms consistent with this, talking to their healthcare professional, but also the dynamic nature of this will change and um, who's eligible for a vaccine, the risks may continue to expand. We, we will obviously always make sure that we are getting information out and particularly uh, amplifying what's coming from uh, the CDC uh, and what the individual experience in New Jersey is. So I think, you know, you know everybody needs to continue to be informed, uh, you know, as we move from the summer and into the fall and as more vaccines become available and, and we get a better handle on, on, on the transmission. So a couple of uh, questions that come into the q and I think would be a good time to um, uh, talk about. So the first one is, if someone touches a door after a person who has monkeypox, will the person get infected? Is that skin to skin? And I think along with that, if you could, you know, talk about, uh, you know, surfaces, I think, you know, and, and how long the virus might be able to stay on the surfaces, et cetera. Sure, I can uh, start with that one. And, and so um, in terms of, uh, you know, a, a doorknob, so skin to skin contact is really meaning that direct contact with the person's skin. However, if someone, you know, did have lesions on their hand, they had infected material and they touched a doorknob, it's possible that that could, um, you know, the virus could get on there if someone is immediately touching that doorknob after that. Uh, I do want to say that, again, overall, we're the, the risk to the public is low, and, and in public areas, we're not thinking about necessarily, you know, if a potentially infectious person was, you know, say, out in the public in a grocery store, the, the, those aren't um, exposures that we're necessarily thinking of. Um, but uh, we do know that the virus can persist, particularly in things like um, clothing or bed linens. And so if someone is sick, you know, we do recommend that that cleaning and disinfection is happening both in uh, with bed linens, clothing, but also on high touch surface areas in the home so that persons who are maybe having higher exposures, uh, continuous exposures with someone that has monkeypox and is um, touching other things in the home um, are, are lowering that risk, but it would certainly be a, a much lower risk than say those direct touching of someone's lesions or direct skin to skin contact. All right, thank you. And I'm oh, good. Uh, I, I was just gonna jump in and expand on what she said as well as answer one of the questions about whether, you know, what is sexually transmitted infection and what the difference is. You know, in order for monkeypox virus to be spread far and away the most common way it's spreading is through contact with the virus the more prolonged the more intense that exposure is the greater the likelihood that somebody is going to catch it if you just have incidental contact to to a low level of virus the chance of contracting it is going to be very low nobody's ever going to be able to tell you it's going to be completely zero because that's mm -hmm. not true but it's going to be much lower than if you have more prolonged and intense contact so what's prolonged and intense contact is? Well, it tends to be where, you know, a large portion of your skin is coming into contact with a large portion of somebody else's skin, uh, where there's a lot of virus around and when there's a lot of rubbing going around. There are a lot of different ways that can happen, but certainly the most common way that we're seeing it happen now is during sexual contact. And that makes sense again. Uh, people tend to be in clothes. You're uh, doing a lot of rubbing back and forth. You may be exposed to a lot of virus. Um, so that's a much, much higher risk than coming into contact with the door that somebody may have touched, where yes, there might be a small amount of virus on it, but your exposure to it is going to be very low for a short period of time without that intense you know, rubbing action that, that can make it easier to transmit as well. Uh, certainly, as Dr. McDermott said, we strongly would recommend, hey, you should be washing your hands anyway when you're touching different things, but we certainly consider that to be a very low risk. 
And that kind of leads to the question about whether something is a sexually transmitted infection. Most commonly people think about sexually transmitted infections as being things like syphilis and gonorrhea, uh, which are usually transmitted through uh, vaginal fluids and, and semen and, and so forth, and for which condoms you know, can give an awful lot of protection. The reason why we say that this is a virus that so far is being commonly transmitted through sex, but is not a sexually transmitted infection is because the virus can be anywhere in the body. I mean, it can be on the hands. You can get it, you know, theoretically again, by just, you know, getting a massage or, or touching somebody in a non-sexual manner as well. Uh, but certainly the virus seems to like mucosal areas, means it tends to like areas around the groin and other places. And when those places rub together, it can spread that way. It has been found in the semen, whether it can be transmitted just you know, through a male ejaculation is, is not entirely clear at this point yet, but clearly it's being transmitted through rubbing back and forth. And whether it's being defined as a sexually transmitted infection to some extent is just a matter of semantics. Uh, again, it happens through close contact almost entirely. Uh, and that close skin to skin contact is most commonly, although certainly does not have to be sexual in nature. And uh, uh, Dr. Lish is capitalizing on, on that kind of conversation. There was a question about whether the use of condoms can help prevent monkeypox, and if so, how significant would that protection be? And that's another area which is not 100% understood. I mean, certainly a condom is, is better than nothing. As been mentioned, it has, the virus has been found in semen, uh, but the general consensus is certainly my feeling is that a uh, condom is not likely to be very protective for the reason that the virus lives not just in semen, but it lives in the skin around there. I mean, you can't cover all your skin in your, it, it can be in anywhere, it can be in the groin, it can be in other parts of the body as well. Um, so you can't be covering all of it. So whereas a condom is likely to offer some protection, uh, I do not think that it's likely to offer very great protection. All right, thank you. Uh, next question I'm going to read out. Uh, will the vaccine be free for everyone? Can individuals who have health issues and might be immunocompromised be eligible to get the vaccine now, even if they haven't knowingly been in contact with someone with monkeypox? So number one, we are, uh, while all the sites are certainly able to collect insurance information and bill uh, the insurance company for the administration part of it, Part of our, the vaccine is itself is being distributed for free to uh, the state and then we're making it available to our partners. And we also have the expectation that everyone who is presenting and self-attesting to being eligible for the vaccine need, will be able to get it regardless of uh, insurance status, ability to pay, et cetera. Uh, so I think it's very important. We, we obviously recognize that uh, they may attempt to, you know, collect insurance information, but if somebody does not have any insurance, et cetera, then uh, the vaccine will be made available to them. And the second part of that question is around uh, eligibility. Right now, we are focused on a, a in really a post-exposure world. Either somebody who's known to be exposed to monkeypox or has had a high likelihood uh, of being exposed uh, within the last two weeks. So that's the group that we're focused on. Uh, this is a self, as we did with the COVID virus, uh, COVID vaccines, this is self-attestation. We're not requiring proof uh, that you fall into that group, but these are what we communicate as the, um, uh, the groups that are eligible for the vaccine. Uh, we believe that they, they may expand uh, eligibility as more vaccine becomes available, as more is understood about who's at risk for it, but that's really what our focus has been uh, so far. And uh, we have a couple other ones. I think this gets back to the, uh, the, the almost like the incidental contact. Would you consider public transportation to be a high risk area where you could potentially get the virus? I think this expands on what you were talking about early, uh, earlier, Dr. McDermott. Yeah, so we would not be considering public transportation uh, a high risk, where it, uh, a high risk of exposure to to getting the virus. So we'd be considering that a a, a very low risk, if if any risk, uh, on those. And uh, continuing on this, uh, there's a, another individual who uh, their partner does a lot of traveling, uh, and so is concerned. Uh, uh, would like to know about bed sheets, particularly laundered bed sheets, whether that would be. Uh, 
uh, an area of concern in terms of transmission. Yeah, so once that um, those bed sheets are, are laundered and would be expecting the hotels to, to be laundering, you know, between each uh, guest. So uh, again, wouldn't be thinking of that as a potential for transmission. Um, so the, once uh, lo uh, standard laundry is sufficient to, um, to clean the sheets properly. Okay. A uh, question about when will vaccines become more readily available? Uh, up until this week, we received about 5,500 doses of the vaccine in the state, the two dose vaccine. So that's really two doses for every one person that we would be able to fully immunize. We know that there is uh, are more doses up to about 20,000 in total that will be coming into the state of New Jersey over the next several weeks. Our intention is to make as many of those doses available while still being able to carry out some of the other things we're doing with uh, the post-exposure prophylaxis that we do with the uh, local health departments. There is also some indication from the federal government that they are considering ways to extend or expand uh, the number of doses that could be administered uh, uh, using the contents of any given vial. Uh, that may uh, you know, quite substantially uh, expand the number of doses available. We also know that the pipeline for additional doses, uh, that several million more doses will be coming available uh, to the United States over the next several months. But we don't have a clear idea of, of when those doses specifically will be coming into New Jersey. But I do want to assure you that the, any doses that we have available uh, that, are, that are allocated in New Jersey, we're getting out uh, both to our current partners and also to um, other uh, other groups that will be coming online in the next um, uh, few days and weeks. Uh, so a few other ones. Uh, uh, this one around infection infected persons coming in contact with pets. What are the chances of then getting it from uh, so the transmission from human to dogs and cats and rabbits and then the transmission you know, back to humans again. Uh, so Dr. McDermott, I would say this is right up your alley. <laughs> yes, so the first thing I will say is that if you do have monkeypox, it's um, recommended that you uh, are not having close contact with any pets. Um, so there's still a lot that we need to learn about this virus and how well it can spread with our to our domestic companion animals. But as we said, Historically, this is a zoonotic disease, meaning that it um, was transmitted from um, different animals to people. And this would be animals um, that are um, harbor the virus and, and live in the Central and West, Western African countries. Um, but because there is that potential risk that a person might spread it to their pet, um, if a person does have monkeypox, if there's someone else in the household that's not infected that can take care of the pet, that would be the best case scenario. Um, if that person um, you know, it lives alone and, and has pets, then um, taking precautions such as not hugging, snuggling with your pet during that time. And I know that can be really difficult, but just trying to take those precautions, um, covering lesions when needing to feed or, or care for the pet and um, even wearing a mask during that time. If you think that your pet may have symptoms, and again, there's some information that we still need to know, but if you're noticing any um signs that the pet seems sick or possibly has any kind of skin rash, um, please contact your veterinarian and they can discuss further. Excellent, thank you. Next question, would previously being vaccinated for chicken pox or smallpox allow some protection from monkey pox? I can take that one um, and I'll start by saying that even though chicken pox and monkey pox sound similar, they are actually very different viruses and no, either having had chicken pox in the past or having received the chicken pox vaccine uh, will not protect you against monkeypox. On the other hand, monkeypox is closely related to smallpox and the vaccines that we are using for monkeypox have actually been developed against smallpox. Uh, so uh, smallpox vaccine will protect against monkeypox. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that we stopped vaccinating people for smallpox in the United States back in the early 1970s, which means that for most people on this call, they've never received a smallpox vaccine. And for those who did, it was a very long time ago. How much immunity might still exist after having been vaccinated that long ago isn't known in general. Once we got past about 10 years or so, we, we would want to boost it. So there are very few people 
in the United States that we would consider to be well protected because they have been previously vaccinated against smallpox. All right, thank you for that. Uh, another question, can you explain why people with eczema and atopic dermatitis are at a higher risk for monkeypox? Uh, the orthopox virus, which includes smallpox, again, it's close relative as well as monkeypox, uh, can cause a very severe skin infection in people who have eczema, either currently have it or have had a previous history of it. Exactly why that occurs is it's not clear, at least to me, but it is likely due to the fact that uh, the, the skin border is, is may not be as strong as far as protection goes compared to others. Uh, so it is has been a concern with some smallpox uh, vaccinations with the smallpox virus and certainly with the mon monkeypox virus that those people with that type of skin condition are at higher risk of, of having a, a more severe reaction. All right, thank you. And uh, we have a testing question. Is there any information about false positive and false negatives with monkeypox testing? What is the time period between when a patient is infected and test positive? And I, I don't know if uh, earlier we talked about how the samples obtained. So you, you wanna talk about how this is a little bit different than what I think people experience with COVID, which is a nasal pharyngeal nasal swab uh, and how this might be a little bit different. So testing for monkeypox involves just taking a swab and just rubbing around any of those skin lesions. So the first thing is in order to test to see if you have it now, you have to have a skin lesion. Uh, where the skin lesions exist, there are virus around it. And all the doctor does is, is take just a, a plain dry swab, rubs it around a couple of different lesions and sends that off to the lab where they do that uh, PCR test to see if the virus exists. It's a very good test, meaning that if the test comes back positive, it is very unlikely to be a false positive, particularly in somebody who has a rash or other symptoms that would suggest it. You know, there is always a potential that if the wrong place is swabbed and there isn't much virus, or it's very late in the course of the disease, that it could conceivably be negative even if the person had monkeypox virus. But overall, it, it's a very good test. Basically, um, if it comes back positive, we're very comfortable it's positive, and it comes back negative, particularly if several lesions have been swabbed, then it's going to be very likely negative as well. All right, thank you. And uh, apparently there have been several questions uh, along this line. With the school year uh, coming up, what precautions should be taken and are there concerns for school-aged children? We, do be, we will be expecting from the department to be putting out further guidance in the future. However, basically what it comes down to is this. Um, the risk from person to person spread, even in places such as schools, even in places where there are younger children who, who do go around touching each other and so forth and, and are well known to, to spread uh, cold viruses and other viruses as well, is still thought to be relatively low. Again, in order for this to spread, you know, we would expect the first child to be sick. And of course, if a child is sick with a rash or otherwise, uh, we expect them to be staying at home no matter what, but if that child's at skin, I'm sorry, if that child's at school, it would typically need prolonged, close skin-to-skin -skin contact, which wouldn't typically happen again in, in our K-12 schools. So while we wouldn't say that the risk is zero, again, this is not a COVID-type situation or a flu-type situation where the viruses are much more easily passed, that pass through uh, breathing and so forth much more easily. So while the risk can't say is zero, we did not expect it to be a high risk situation. All right, appreciate that. We're gonna answer, I think, I think uh, a couple of more questions. I know I wanna leave some time at the end just for uh, uh, you know the panel to uh, say some final comments. So you know, we've talked a lot about skin to skin contact. So there's a question about whether the state will put mandates in place for skin to skin businesses like massage, manicure salons, et cetera, to wear gloves. Yeah. 
so I, I think one thing I'll just say is as uh, I think we've mentioned a couple of times this uh, this outbreak in the situation is rapidly evolving and as as it evolves, we will continue to assess and see what kind of recommendations are needed for um, you know different businesses and different individuals. Um, at this time we don't have any um, plans for specific um, mandates or don't have specific guidance for those um, but um, as this develops um, it, I would recommend going to our New Jersey Department of Health site and we will continue to have updated information there. Excellent and this will be the last question I think we touched on it a little bit during the slides. Is an individual infectious before they develop skin lesions? So an individual, if they um, have symptoms that started before skin lesions, so if they had a fever, um, some of those muscle aches, they would be considered infectious from the start of any symptom. So it does not have to be the rash. However, um, as we discussed that, rash, those infected lesions, those are kind of your highest risk categories, but they are considered potentially infectious from the start of any symptoms, if any developed before that rash. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have a, a few more minutes before we uh, finish up with the hour that's allotted for this. Uh, you know, first of all, I wanna thank uh, everybody joining this and remind everybody that uh, this has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube site. Uh, so you can uh, re-listen to some of the questions and answers or uh, with slides or, uh, you know, send this to your uh, friends and colleagues. Um, but I, I really also, uh, you know, particularly for uh, Chris and Kathy, um, any other thoughts as we're closing up in terms of communication uh, or things to emphasize? You know, I think it's important to um, for everybody to, to follow the science, right? I think that uh, we want to pay attention to this. It, it, it's clearly, it is impacting our communities. Um, and I think the state has done a very good job of following the epidemiology, right? And that's where the vaccines were first eligible in, in the areas closest to New York City, which had a larger outbreak. So we went to Newark, went to Jersey City, went to Asbury, because we know, um, you know, Asbury is the place to be during the summer if you're part of the LGBTQ community. Um, and, then, and then spread it out, you know, the vaccines will, will continue to follow the science. But I think everybody just needs to sort of take a breath recognize their own personal risk and then follow the guidelines that work, you know, that make sense for them without sort of creating a panic for, for everybody in the broader community. Chris, any other uh, final thoughts? Yeah, I, I just, uh, again, echo everything Kathy just said and just would encourage folks to take appropriate precautions. Again, not we're not trying to infringe on folks' lifestyle choices, just trying to keep folks safe and keep the public safe and limit further spread, both in gay and bisexual male communities, as, as well as the public at large. Um, and to just utilize the, the wonderful and trusted providers that we partner with, again, the three that we've named and um, the additional two sites, as well as more to come likely in the future, depending on, you know, kind of how things go um, uh, data-wise and, and resources-wise. Uh, so the, the, you know, the right approach, the right trust is there and just would encourage folks to, to utilize that. Hey, thank you. Uh, Dr. McDermott, McDermott, any other uh, thoughts? Um, I think Chris and, and Kathy just covered it well. Thanks. Right. And uh, finally, Dr. Lipschitz, any, uh, anything you'd like to add? I hate to be boring and agree with the other panelists, but absolutely what, what they said, you know, this is something that certainly should be paying close attention to and being aware of, particularly if you're at a more risk community. Uh, however, this is also not COVID. It is not going to spread nearly as easily. Um, so we just need to be aware. Thank you. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, the, these great panelists. And, and part of what I want to emphasize is uh, you know, this is a, uh, a very complex collaborative response that uh, we're, we're all doing together to, um, uh, you know, a virus we weren't worried about a couple of months ago. And, and I completely agree with Dr. Lipschitz that this is not COVID. At the same time, this requires that a level of cooperation and collaboration in terms of response that we did during the pandemic and from the Department of Health to our partners like uh, the group that Kathy leads to, um, 
you know, working with our local health departments, working with the federal government to get vaccines available, to coordinate testing. Uh, and for the public, I think it's that the need to uh, stay well read, continue to, uh, you know, go to trusted sources of information and find out what's going on, look for the changes. Because, you know, this, our understanding will, will change. Um, there may be other, uh, uh, other groups that will be uh, at higher risk and under threat. We'll continue to try to, you know, uh, follow the science as, as Kathy was talking about and, and utilize the data we have. Uh, and I and really would encourage you all to uh, stay well informed. Uh, but at that, I want to thank you all for attending. I uh, hope that you all have a great and safe weekend. And certainly the, the resources that are posted on this, uh, on this final page, please make use of it. Uh, and we'll be updating those uh, with the most uh, up-to-date information and the newest information we have on a regular basis. So thank you for joining us and have a good day.